All right, I've got 6.30. It's good to see you tonight. Father, thank you for the day. God, just thank you for your many blessings. Uh, God, I pray you be with our Bible study in uh, just a special way. God, thank you for our prayer time afterwards. And uh, God, I just thank you that, uh, Lord, you, you have every answer to every problem we have uh, in your word. Uh, so God, just uh, be with us tonight, Lord, as we look at your love. God, I pray that we could understand how much you love us uh, and the depth in which you love us also. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, we'll be looking at verses 7 through 21. 1 John 4, 7 is where we'll start. And let me go ahead and give you the outline for tonight. Uh, and I'm talking to you about God's love, uh, God's love. Uh, number one, what God is, okay, what God is. Number two, what God is doing, what God is and what God is doing. And number three, what God has done, what God has done. You know, in first, first John was written centuries ago by the Apostle John, uh, one of Jesus' closest friends. This personal letter speaks volumes about the person of uh, Jesus Christ as the true Son of God. Uh, in chapter 1, John speaks uh, personally, uh, of personally witnessing who Jesus was and all that he was about. He spoke of the importance of fellowship with God also. In John chapter 2, he spoke of knowing you are saved and walking in light. In 1 John 3, he teaches us about being children of God and the importance of love. And in John chapter 4, he speaks of God's very nature, which is love. Love is not a, a forced response. It is a natural response to someone who has been born again. Part of that love has to do with loving God and loving our brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's look at this wonderful scripture entitled, God's love. First John 4, 7, beloved. Twice he will use the word beloved, and he is talking to Christians. Uh, let us love one another. And three times in our scripture text, you will see uh, the writer John saying, let us love one another, for love is of God. And folks, we know we all should love one another. Matter of fact, you know, God's nature and, and when Jesus comes into our life uh, should be a nature of love. And we know that all love comes from God, all right? It comes from God. So let's continue. And everyone, everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And again, it's not saying people that are not saved don't love, all right? It's a different type of love. Yes, they can love their job, they can love their wife, they can love their children, but not the kind of love that we are speaking of. And let me go ahead and give you the bottom line to this part of it. Man's love is conditional. Okay, the world's or man's love, however you, however you want to say that. I love you because you love me. I'm nice to you because you're nice to me. But God's love is unconditional. God's love is unconditional, and that is very, very important. Look at verse 8. He who does not love does not know God. And here it is, twice in our text, John says, God is love. So when I said before, what is God? He answers it right there. I'll tell you what God is. God is love. His very nature is love. His character is love. His actions are our love. Okay? So we see that God is love. Verse 9, in this the love of God was manifested towards us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this love that God has, it was manifested. What does that mean? It was openly seen. Okay, a manifesto is a list of everything that's on a ship. They know what's on that ship. And God uh, showed his love. He openly showed his love by sending his son, Jesus Christ, 
to die for us. And we know John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God loved us so much, all right, that he sent his Son. Now look at verse 10. And in this love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. Okay? Uh, I, I was at a conference in Oklahoma City. Uh, it was an evangelism conference. And this lady named Iris Blue, I don't know if you've heard of her, uh, but she came and gave her testimony. And she has a stirring testimony. I mean, it was one of those things that just brought chills up on me. And to this day, and, and I'm, I'm talking, this has probably been 30 years ago. And I can still remember it. And then she started singing this song at the end of it, He Came to Me. Okay, and I don't know all the words to the song, and I didn't look it up, but basically it's saying that we were not seeking God. God was seeking us. And he came to me. When I could not go to where he was, he came to me. And I'm telling you, when she got through, there was not a dry eye in, that house, in, in the church house. Because she gave her testimony of how far she was away from God, how uh, drugs had just tore her whole life up. Her whole life was a train wreck. And folks, that's how much God loves us. He doesn't leave us where we are. He comes to us. And he loves us so much that he sent his son to die for us. And it says, the rest of that verse, and he sent his son to be the propitiation of, for our sins. And of course, the payment uh, for our sins is what it means. His blood, Jesus' blood paid for our sins. And it says, beloved, there's the word again, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. And in this, he speaks of uh, three more times of loving one another. The importance of loving one one another's. And because God loves us, we should love one another. 1 Corinthians, go with me to 1 Corinthians if you would. 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging symbol. Folks, anybody can say I love you, okay? But love is an action word. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, though I have all the faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Folks, I am telling you, God is love, and we need to uh, reflect God's love in our personal lives. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long. What does that mean? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. And folks, you can go back to the verse that I read earlier. God is love. And God suffers long. God is kind. God does not envy. You could put that in there to see that he is the epitome of love. Love does not uh, behave itself rudely does not seek its own, is not provoked, love thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth, bears all things, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Folks, I'm telling you, God's love is not man's love. God's love is agape love. He was willing to let his Son, die for you and I. So we see what God is, and God is love. Not only is uh, what God is, the second thing I want you to see is what God is doing. Look in verse 12. Verse 12. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. And a lot of times, you know, you, you, know, you talk about love, you know, I, you know you've seen things that uh, people have been long ago, it was letters. They had never met, but they were corresponding with letters. Now, 
uh, they see people on computer or, or they live across the country from one another. And, and they just say, I haven't seen this person in person, but, but I still love this person. I'm attracted to this person. I, 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 There's just something about this person. And nobody has seen God is what he's saying, but still we love God. Folks, I've never seen, I've seen his manifestations. I've sensed his Holy Spirit. I've seen his power, but as far as seeing him, and, and it's kind of, you know, Missouri, the show me thing. All right, God has shown us Him. Just read through the Word of God. You can see the you can see God everywhere. You can see God's love everywhere. And folks, you think about the children of Israel. All right, they'd love God for a while. They'd serve God for a while, and then they'd mess up. And what would God do? Yes, He had to punish them. Yes, He put them in the wilderness. Yes, they were in captivity. But yet, He always loved them. And it says, his love has been perfected in us. Folks, he's still working on us. We don't have perfect love. Okay, we don't. But again, part of that is talking about a mature love. A mature love. That's what perfecting means. Because we know we're not perfect. His love is perfect. But we are perfecting God's love in us. Verse 13, by this we know that we abide in Him. And by the way, in this section alone, the word abide is used six times. Six times. What, it, what does it mean to abide with someone? It means to hang out with them. All right? To dwell with them. Okay? And here's what it's saying. To love people the way you ought to pe- love people, you have to dwell with God. Okay, you have to be around God. You have to be around God's Word. You have to be in God's Word. You have to be in communion with God. The more we abide with God, the easier it is to love people. And I know what you're thinking right now. Oh, you hadn't met, you haven't met, and you fill in the blank. All right, there are challenging people in this world, folks. I understand that. But we have to love people the way God loves people. It's very, very important. And the key is abiding in that love. And by this we know, verse 13, that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us His Spirit. Folks, the Holy Spirit abiding in us is the key to love. Because you know what that Holy Spirit tells you? When you are not loving someone, when you say something that is not loving. When you treat somebody, you know, not, you know, like you shouldn't treat them, that Holy Spirit is inside of us. And, and folks, you think about it. We've got God is love, which is the example. We've got Jesus Christ who loved us so much that he was willing to die for us. Folks, it, he, he didn't have to do it. He was willing to die for us. Read the gospels, folks. And then we've got the Holy Spirit inside of us that enables us to love even the unlovable. And folks, there was a time in my life and in your life before you came to Christ that I'm just telling you, I know I wasn't lovable a lot of the time. All I cared about was myself. All I cared about was what made me happy. All I cared about, and you can just fill in the blank. But folks, that is a selfish kind of love and God sent this example and he has given us the Holy Spirit verse 14 and we have seen and testified that the father has sent the son as the savior of the world folks you cannot find a better example that lived here on earth and loved people than Jesus folks he loved the sinner he loved the tax collectors he loved the prostitutes why, you know, he, he can't be the Son of God. He can't be the Messiah. He hangs out with these folks. And he has set the example of that kind of love. And then verse 15, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God abides in him and he in God. Folks, I am telling you, the key is abiding. The key to love is abiding. The closer you get to God, 
the easier it is to love everyone unconditionally. Why? Because that's what he, that's what he did. And even in our practical life, we're talking about now, the key when we're talking about the Spirit of God is being filled with the Spirit. I mean, Ephesians uh, 6 tells us, uh, excuse me, 5 tells us to be filled with the Spirit. And I'm telling you, when we're filled with the Spirit, it's just easier to love people. And that is so, so important. Verse 16, and we have known and believed the love that God has for us God is love. There's the second time. And anytime something's written twice, it's for emphasis. It's, it's saying in this section, remember, if you don't remember another thing I say tonight, remember those third, three words. God is love. And he who b- abides in love abides in God and God in him. Folks, abiding is so, so important. Hold your finger there and go to John 15 with me. John 15. John 15, verse 1. The Bible said, I am the true vine. This is Jesus' words. My Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit He takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. And basically, folks, it's talking about being hooked up, being uh, abiding with Christ, okay? Uh, He is the vine dresser. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Now, here's the verses I wanted to get to. Verse 4, abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Folks, you have to stay hooked up to the uh, the vine. I mean, when we have storms and there's branches that break and fall off, folks, I'm just telling you, you know, they're going to die. You know, apart from that tree, they're going to die. So we need to abide in God and abide in God. In Jesus Christ. Verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Now, some writers say that fruit is salvation, that is uh, winning people to Christ, which it can be. But I believe as important as that are the fruits of the Spirit. And what is the first fruit listed in the fruits of the Spirit? It's love. Folks, we must love one another. And then it says, uh, verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Folks, we need to abide with God. We need God in our life. We need to think the way God would think and think the way Jesus. We need the mind of Christ. That's what abiding is. Abiding in Him. Verse uh, 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done unto you. What is he talking about? Folks, a lot of that is speaking in prayer. It's, ta- it, it's talking to God. It's, it's praying to God. It's having communion with God. It's intercessory prayer for others. Okay? We, I mean, I've said this before. You can't be mad at somebody you're praying for. You can't hold a grudge with somebody that you're praying for. And folks, we've all, people have done us wrong. We all know that. But if we abide, if we take Jesus' example, you just think of what they did to Jesus. Folks, but he loved them. He loved them. And then verse 8, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciple. Do you know how we glorify God? By loving others. By loving others. Do you know what's wrong with our world? I mean, our world needs Jesus. I know that's an obvious answer. They need Jesus. But you know what's messed up? The the thing that is missing in our world? It's love. Because man's love will not satisfy the soul. 
And you just think about all the unrest. All You could just start naming the things that has divided our country. And folks, it would be totally different if we could get back to loving people the way God loves people. You know, every human being, the strongest, one of the strongest desires they have is to love and to be loved. Nobody likes to be rejected. Nobody likes to think they're not important. And I guess the thing that drives me crazy right now, especially when it comes to death, is before I could walk into a home and I could shake somebody's hand and I could embrace somebody, I could hug somebody that is hurting. And folks, that, that, it's just hard. But still there are things that we can do to show them that we love them. So, back in our text, what is God doing? What is God doing? He's abiding in us. What do we need to do? Folks, we need to abide in Him. What God is, God is love. What God is doing, He is abiding in us. Then the last thing, number three, what God has done. What God has done. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. And again, there's all kinds of people that think of all kinds of ways. The Bema Seat. Of course, we know we do not want to be at the great white throne judgment, okay? Because, you know, you're, I mean, you're going to be condemned, folks. You're going to hell if you're at that one. But even at the judgment seat, you know what he is saying there? Folks, we as Christians should not worry about that, okay? Because our sins will not be judged. Our sins were given to Christ. It, you know, they were judged on the cross. And, and he's, he's, he's talking about, folks... You know, we should not live in fear. We should not live in fear. And it says, because he is, so are we in this world. We are secure. We are loved. All right, we are loved. There is no fear in love. So what has God done? Folks, God's love cast out fear. You heard me say it many, many times. What's the number one fear that man has? It's dying. But why? I'm just telling you to a Christian, folks, we should not fear that. Why? Because of God's love. Folks, I'm telling you, when you take your last breath here on earth, you will be escorted. You will be, uh, angels will, will take your soul and you will be in the very Shekinah glory and presence of God. So there is no fear in love, but perfect love cast out fear. Folks, again, I want to go back to Jesus Christ. He was the only one on earth that had perfect love. Perfect loved. And it cast out fear. You know, Jesus wasn't afraid to die. Okay, when he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, it wasn't one of those things, man, Lord, get me out of this. I've, I've had some second thoughts about this. But, but the thing was that he knew physically what he was going to go through. But he went through it because of love. And folks, uh, you know, man, man should not live in fear. I, I, I hate it when there's households where, a, where a, a wife is afraid of a husband or a child is afraid of a father or any of the situations that go on. Folks, children should not have to live in fear. Why? Because God is love. And we need to show people the love of God in our lives. But perfect love casts out fears because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. You know what Satan tells us? He tells us that, oh man, you messed up. He tells us that, you know God's mad at you. You know, you know God doesn't like you anymore. You know what you did, those thoughts that you had, or those actions that you did, or you embarrassed God. He just throws those things in our lives. Folks, God's love is not that way. God's love is perfect. And again, I'm not saying, I mean, you know, you know, 1 John 1, 9, I've quoted a thousand times in 17 years. 
you know. But we should not fear. I mean, you know, shake, tremble at God. Perfect love casts out fear. And then verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. And what God is trying to do, what he's trying to show us when it talks about perfection again is mature love. Mature love. And folks, you, you can just see, you, you know kids when they're teenagers and all, you know, it's that puppy love, it's that giggly, you know, gooey stuff, that, you know, and, you know, they just, they don't see things. They re don't really know what love is. But he's saying, the closer you get to Christ, the more you abide in Christ, the more mature your love will be. And verse 20, verse 20 says, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? Matter of fact, let me just paraphrase this for you. You need to take hate out of your vocabulary, folks. We should hate no one. We should hate no one. Okay, now you can hate the devil and you can hate sin, but we should love the sinner. Look back at 1 John 3. 1 John 3, verse 1. 1 John 3, 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. Hey, what, what, what should be one word description of children of God? Love. It ought to be love. Therefore the world does not know uh, us because it did not know him. Beloved, there's that word. Now we are children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we will know when he is revealed and we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. You know when we'll find out and we'll experience that perfect love? Folks, it'll be in heaven. It'll be in heaven. And I believe, and, and again, this is my personal opinion, I believe because no more crying, no more tears, none of that, no more pain, no more sorrow, I believe somewhere in that transition time, God is going to erase our memory bank of those things that just hurt us. I've had people ask me all the time, what if I get there and my parents or my grandparents aren't there? What would you feel that way? You would feel terrible about that. But basically what he is saying is, you know, on this side of heaven, we will not know perfect love apart from knowing God, apart from knowing Jesus Christ. But we will understand that. Folks, I, what I'm trying to say is, you know, we, we can't even fathom in our mind what heaven's going to be like. But not only can we not fathom what it's going to be like, I don't think we can fathom how much love there is going to be there. Just the, the presence of God and that deep, unconditional love for his children. Verse 21, And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. What is a commandment? It's something you've got to do, folks. You've got to do this. And, and it's so important that we love others. And, and the commandment is, is no, op no options. 1 Corinthians 13, let's go back there and we'll close with this. 1 Corinthians 13, talking about God's love. Look at verse 8. I love this. Love never fails. You can put God's name in there. God never fails. Jesus never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Okay? Preaching. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Where there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part will be done away with folks God's love lasts forever his love lasts forever when I was a child I spoke as a child and I understood as a child and I thought as a child but when I became a man I put away childish 
things. Now, folks, we have to perfect our love. And, and folks, there's going to be times that people are not loving you. They're not treating you right. They're not doing the right thing. And you do not need to respond the way they are. You need to be a reflection of God's love. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Folks, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of situations and circumstances of life that I don't understand. I don't understand, but the key is, folks, I don't have to. Folks, God's sovereign. God's in control. God knows what he's doing. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am known. We will be like Jesus. That's, that's what First John 3 is saying. Okay, that glorified body, that perfect mind, that perfect you know, everything is perfect. In verse 13, and now abide faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Father, thank you for your love. God, I thank you how much you love us. I thank you how deep you love us. God, I thank you for the example of love that you have set. And God, I just pray that we, we would be uh, a loving Christian, that we would turn that other cheek and we wouldn't respond, uh, that we would just pray for those who, who persecute us. God, I pray that uh, we would just abide in you, Lord. Uh, we need to hang out with you. Uh, we'll do the right thing, Lord. Fill us with your spirit. Fill us with your love. Thank you for your example of love. And God, I pray that we will just not fear God, not, a, not be afraid of people, not be afraid of death, uh, because, Lord, uh, uh, fear comes from Satan, and we know that. We know that. So, God, I pray that we in our own personal lives will perfect that love that you have placed inside of us. And, God, I pray that we will love the unlovable and uh, just uh, show people uh, you know, that we love them, whether it's a phone call or a card or uh, going by and seeing somebody or whatever you tell us to do, God. I pray that uh, as we go out, even from now to till Sunday, Lord, that you would just uh, put someone in our lives, put someone on our heart that need to see the love of God in action. So God, help us uh, just to get the word hate out of our vocabulary. There's no room. There's just no room uh, for hate in our lives. And God, I, I just pray, Lord, that we would just reflect your love in everything we do. God, people know. People know if we love them. People know. And, and God, I just pray uh, that we would show them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We thank you for joining us this evening at Rahel Baptist Church. And may God richly bless you.